Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Trino Community Broadcast. It is May. We finished Cinco de Trino on the 5th of May. Commander Banban is helping us as usual. And today we also have Anna and Martin join us. And it is the 19th of May, but actually we're going to talk about the number 17. <laughs> I More feel like we're in a Sesame. We're like, <laughs> we're like in a Sesame Street uh, episode. I've been watching a lot of that recently. It's like today the number is 17. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And more about that later. But let's what's happening today. Yeah. So uh, so today we are going to be uh, kind of building up a little bit of uh, momentum towards uh, like a couple of things that we have going on in the Trino project uh, uh, in the upcoming months. Um, and particularly just like uh, one of the big ones is, you know, Trino is is about to hop up to another LTS uh, release. Uh, for Java, so that's like uh, super exciting because it enables a lot of uh, you know features and language stuff, and that's actually a lot of what we're going to be diving into at first. And then we're going to kind of talk a little bit about you know, like what that means for the project and uh, kind of uh, any anybody uh, kind of anticipating this. I remember there was a little bit of you know I think it was like a lot of confusion around the not confusion, but like I guess uh, resistance to upgrading from Java eight to Java eleven, and my my personal thought on this is that Java eight had been around for so long that like people were just so stuck into it that like it, nobody wanted to move on it really. But I feel like it's actually been a shorter time. Like it's basically been almost four years since Java eleven release. So it doesn't. I don't feel like it feels quite as long. Like it feels like we did the update not too long ago, and it was actually not super painful for most people uh, unless they had like you know commute company policy or something to fight so so i'm actually really excited to just kind of like get everybody super hyped up about like the features coming in java 17 and then kind of talking about what that means uh for for trino and stuff so and martin is going to tell us all about it because he knows a lot more about this than 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 those than us two right <laughs> i'm pretty sure yeah if, we, if it was just me and manfred talking about it here it'd be just like the blind leading the blind here so yeah no uh, no no it's not that bad like you know like i i, I remember <laughs> doing a major migration from java 4 to java 5 that was a big one <laughs> that's a while ago <laughs> that's right yeah concurrency <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay cool so uh we're gonna do uh the intro a little bit uh sorry in intro like not the uh this intro but the uh kind of advertisement that we typically pull you into Starburst. Today we've brought on uh, Anna. And so welcome, Anna. Nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. So, uh, so yeah, so we, we typically just, you know, do, uh, do an ad, but we, we wanted to like pull you in. And first thing, I want to introduce you to the entire community because they don't see you. They actually uh, usually just, you know, you're working in the background for a lot of things that they come to enjoy, like Trino Summit and Cinco de Trino recently and Trino Meetups. You're literally like, you know, my, my backup person to kind of be the liaison to help me plan all this stuff. So I just wanted everybody to know that Anna's amazing and uh, she's really helped out a lot with, uh, you know, probably sending a lot of you these little Commander Bun Bun Bunnies if you haven't got one yet. So so thanks for everything you're doing, Anna. And, and I'm glad that everybody gets a, finally a chance to put a, a face to the name if, if you've emailed her before. <laughs> yeah, and you've been working on a really cool project recently that I heard um, has a whole bunch of space stuff going on. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so basically Space Quest League, it's a year-long competition um, with four individual sweepstakes, um, also known as missions. So it's built by data pros, for data pros. Um, you compete in SQL query challenges, weekly data wordles. Um, I'm also super excited about our do well and do good component, which um, we've allocated $1 per uh, participant up to $100,000 to donate to a charity. So mission one is completed and the winner it will be off to um, the Disney to, to explore the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser. Um, oh, so that was like the prize for, yeah, for mission one. Was, that was mission one's prize. Um, oh, that's awesome. And wow. so we had a winner and him and his family are going to go and they have awesome Star Wars costumes. <laughs> oh, sweet. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of curious. So if you missed out on mission one, like, yeah. are you able to just hop in now still? Like, yep. you could so, yeah, we're totally in mission two now. And as you can see, 
it's a 20k payday not not a trip to disney but um i mean i'm sure nobody's gonna really push back on a twenty thousand dollar paycheck (laughs) that should be able to get you to disney at least you yourself maybe you don't want to take your family and then you just keep the rest of the money (laughs) yes um ryan (laughs) just kidding (laughs) i've been it's a pandemic i've been i've been stuck in my house for too long (laughs) yeah you can do whatever you want with your with the 20k payday but um if you scroll down brian to the um to the form um, okay. you enter and then yep you've already so i just i just signed up just now actually and i, I there's basically i didn't you didn't get to see this before but you would basically be met with like a little form i guess with like your name your email and uh linkedin and stuff like that and basically a couple of things to fill out and once you do that then i guess all this stuff opens up to me right like i got to start doing these challenges yep so um you're able to do all these challenges and the the more you compete uh you'll gain additional entries basically for, for July 1st when we announce the winner. So okay. um, if you compete in all of them, you've significantly increased your chance of winning. Uh, and we have super cool, like SQL, SQL. We have a whole technical challenge team um, that creates really awesome cha- like SQL query challenges um, to test, test your knowledge and yeah. Weekly data wordles. Um, wow. So I actually have to know my stuff. Yeah. You yeah, do. have to actually like write SQL queries or something. Yeah, if you go down, Brian, to um, at the bottom, okay. Uh, data challenge number three. Data. Ch- oh wait, let me see. Oh, yeah, you. Where's it? I skipped it. Oh, wait, there's data no, challenge no. two. That that's one. Um, yeah. Oh, here we go. Here, here we go. There data we go. Data challenge three. Um, that's the question, and you you use the link. Uh, oh, cool. Okay, question. so is this like? Uh, oh, is this actually? So I, I'll go in here and I'll uh, use. Basically, so th- this is going to be using the uh, the SAS Trino Galaxy product to to actually go and. Uh, yeah, to, this is to... the only one so far for that. But um, the other da- data challenges, it's just a, an image of a. I think Brian, you actually were the creator of the other ones. Uh, <laughs> this one, this one's probably. Me. What's the output of the following query? Let's yeah. see. Oh. So, so <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. And then you answer it, and you get the points if you if you answer correctly. Um, yeah, and and I think cheating uh, cheating is allowed on this. If you want to run like a local Trino instance, or if you want to run run in this what in do Galaxy. You mean that's not cheating. That's the proper way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I don't know. Some people like to do this stuff on their head. So <laughs> that's I, cheating. <laughs> that, that's cheating if you're able to do this in your head it's like why do you even need trino okay <laughs> cool um yeah what? so we come out with fun weekly weekly challenges and the winner will, will be announced july 1st for this 20k payday and then oh we have wordles <laughs> yeah data wordles <laughs> nice oh that's um, sick yeah okay um, cool that is that is my spiel on space quest league and i'll put the link in the in the chat to sign up perfect awesome. yeah that looks like a lot of fun anna yeah, yeah thank you Super. for having me and letting me show it all right thanks anna um so uh so without further ado uh let's then hop right on to uh the uh the releases we had about uh three releases squeeze in since the last uh the last episode yeah 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 we were still uh, trying to hang in there on our our, our weekly wednesday release <laughs> it's doing well i think 381 381 uh actually it drifted all the way across the weekend to monday but <laughs> <laughs> But we, we did manage to get it in. There's a couple of cool changes. Um, since Martin is here, how about uh, you tell us the official ideas and like highlights you, you thought were worth mentioning in uh, 379, 380, and 381? All right. It's been a while, so I, I forgot everything about <laughs> uh, 379 and 380. Um, just, work, <laughs> you just start from 381 and work your way back, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, but the big one for in, in 381 is uh, we, we added support, uh, ex- ex- experimental support still, but uh, it's a very, very important and big feature. Uh, it's called ta- table functions. This is a new, a new capability in Trino. It's a, it basically adds, adds a complete new layer of, uh, of capabilities to uh, your queries. And it's, a, it's something that is defined by the SQL specification, but we, we didn't support it until now. Uh, so the idea with a table function is that um, unlike scalar functions or aggregation functions or window functions, these are functions that uh, can take tables as inputs or subqueries as input, the results of subqueries as, as inputs, and then they can produce entire tables. So effectively, it's a, it's a function that you can use in your from clause. Uh, so this uh, right now we don't have any functions implemented, but over over time we'll be able to. Uh, implement some features that are, are not possible to express in in SQL uh, today, or even uh, there's no way to in, in, in Trino at all today. Uh, 
Yeah, and that's that one was backed by Cassio, right? Like she she's yeah. doing a lot of this work and she's like same. So we had Cassio on in episode twenty three, uh, doing match rec, talking about like match recognize, and she's been working on like a lot of these like window functions and all these other things before this that also kind of stretch the limits of like you know enterprise level SQL capabilities. And now this is like I think another kind of the next iteration. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Does, it, um, does, it, does yeah. this uh, actually enable us? To, I thought yeah, at one point I heard you say like this does lets us do like pivot table kind of functions. One, one of the functions you would be able to implement is pivoting. Yes. Uh, cool. You can you, because you can you have a, you have a function that can see the result, the entire result of a table of, of a subquery or a table, mm -hmm. and and then you can pivot and then produce another table as an output. Yeah. Uh, so over time we we expect to have those functions implemented. That's awesome. Yeah, because I know that's like a, a very commonly like discussed one and and used you highly used one in the kind of data science uh, analyst community. Yeah, so people that want to work on that, like like from what I understand, talking to Cassia and working on the documentation with her, um, the table functions need to implement it in in the individual connectors. So anyone that's interested to like work on that with us, um, there's some documentation on what to write, and we'd love to you know, get ideas from the community on, on, on what you're looking for with that. So we have user yeah. based documentation, that kind of stuff. So it'll be great to hear from you. Yeah, they, so it, it's, it's, a, it's going to be a um, long process. I mean, right now we have the initial uh, implementation. So you can define functions. Uh, they, it's functions that can be pushed down back into connectors. So it enables certain certain use cases. I, we're not going to talk about this, this today, but uh, uh, hopefully, we're going to be writing a uh, blog post or something describing oh, yeah. the, the, the capabilities and limitations in the first version. Then over time, we're going to expand that to be able to execute uh, more complex functions. Oh, that's yeah. super cool. Super cool. Um, right. And then the uh, another big one is uh, we now have support for uh, updates with the iceberg, con iceberg connector. Uh, so we've had that for... Uh, the Hive connector and, uh, and a few others. Finally, we, we've added that functionality to the Iceberg connector. Nice. And I mean, update has been in the engine for uh, for a long time now, so this just enables it for that uh, specific connector. Um, and then, well, Manfred, I'll let you cover the other ones. I know if uh, yeah, sure, um, there are smaller ones, but uh, I know if there's anything you think worth mentioning. Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, three seventy nine. I wanted to mention the MariaDB connector, um, brand new connector. Uh, for those of you that migrated over from MySQL to MariaDB, um, we do want you to change over because um, the MariaDB connector is basically on par with the MySQL connector, but it uses the MariaDB JDBC driver, and there is some there's a better compatibility story there uh, overall. So um, let us know if you're using that connector, and like you know, send your pull request to add further features and stuff like that. Obviously, um, bunch of performance. Uh, fee, uh, improvements for union uh, group buy and join and stuff like that. Um, Delta Lake Connector has again gotten more improvements. In this case, uh, we now have support for Google Cloud Storage as well. Nice. Um, which is really cool. Um, when it comes to the storage, also there's another interesting change, and that is the exchange spooling uh, from the fault tolerant execution uh, now supports Azure Blob Storage in 381. Oops. And uh, we are already working on Google Cloud Storage support for that as well, which is really cool. Um, if you're a Cassandra user and you're still stuck on the old V2 protocol, then you uh, will not want to upgrade because that's now no longer supported. But that's also very, very old. But the upside on that is that the newer V5 and V6 protocols are supported now. So um, basically keeping up with the time, just like we do in many other things. Um, uh, for the table functions, we already talked about this, that basically it's the framework uh, in place. Um, another important thing is um, if you are upgrading uh, to any of these versions, upgrade to 381, specifically also if you're an LDAP user, because this LDAP.SSL trust uh, certificate uh, property uh, for a while was basically breaking your upgrade story. Now that works transparently again because we changed it. So it's basically a legacy configuration. So there's no more surprises when you're upgrading. Uh, I think that's about it. Um, another cool change that came from Starburst um, for the people that are using the SQL Server connector, we now have bulk data insertion, uh, which had quite a bit of change. And um, something related also that's coming in one of the next releases, I just watched a performance team uh, testing uh, video yesterday. 
that was super interesting where bulk insertion have some really surprising uh, impact in terms of how this works on Oracle and others. So we got a couple of really cool performance improvements coming very soon there. Cool. I think that's that's the main changes we should be talking about. Nice. Yeah, I and, mean, it's a lot of great stuff. Yeah, of course, also, you know, there's there's quite a lot more, actually, if you look at the release notes, the JDBC connectors have a bunch of improvements and other things. Just make sure you check the release notes for those. And as always, um, if you have a proper infrastructure in place, an upgrade is always worth it because there's always more stuff coming. Yeah, and if any of these things uh, really like uh, help out, you know, your particular workflow or anything, and and actually, uh, you know, get you up and running on on a certain use case you're working on, uh, I want to start encouraging people uh, write a blog about it and and let me know, and we would love to get you published on uh, the uh, the Trina blog, uh, yeah. especially if you're you're uh, particularly you know something something on this list or something that you know you just started using Trino and and. Uh, um, it's, uh, something that is, you know, you, you're, you're really excited about the use case that you're able to solve with it. Um, just, just let me know and, uh, we'll, we'll get you on, uh, the Trina blog, uh, on the website. Cool. So, uh, one quick thing I wanted to recap. Uh, so there, uh, t now it's like two weeks ago, actually literally two weeks ago today. Uh, we had, it was, uh, Cinco de Mayo and, uh, we, uh, we, uh, had a event called, we called Cinco de Trino. Uh, and basically, uh, we, we got a whole bunch of people together, um, you know, a lot of technologies that were being discussed a lot in the community and a lot of them happened to kind of circle around maybe like a, you know, kind of these data lake, uh, kind of slash ETL type technologies. So we, we kind of ended up coming up with this really cool theme of like a, a data lake house, Trino as a data lake house theme. And Martin, you, you had a really cool talk talking about like, you know, bringing, bringing back kind of, uh, to me, it was like bringing back Trino to one of its more original use cases, which was like, you know, replace initially kind of replacing hive, uh, which some call a data warehouse, but you know, so we'll, we'll say it was replacing a, you know, big data, data warehouse at the time, but then kind of, uh, more, uh, as, as time went on, people started to know Trino for like the, the federated query use cases and being super fast. But then as now we're kind of like doing this full circle thing of like getting back to, uh, the the uh, uh, you know ETL or larger batch scale jobs that that Trino has always been able to handle since the days of Facebook. Uh, we're we're starting to see those come back into the forefront now with Project uh, Tardigrade coming to a close and bringing us things like failure recovery and all this stuff. It's it's uh you know kind of making the 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 pic painting the picture for using Trino as a you know as a ETL batch engine as well as like something that can also serve the queries for the end users. So, um, so you kind of talked about that. We had, you know, talk on Project Tardigrade and what uh, features it was delivering. Uh, Dane did a, a lab on, uh, you know, the, the Starburst product, uh, Starburst Galaxy. Um, we had great expectations talking about, you know, uh, data quality checks. Uh, Airbyte talking about data ingestion. Um, DBT talking about like everything that DBT <laughs> as the tool does. It's such a it's such a Swiss army knife, just like Trino. So those two, our, our two tools together actually makes, uh, for a very exciting, like, uh, 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 uh pairing for like, uh, being able to just do a whole bunch of stuff for your data pipelines and, and anything you're trying to, any architecture you're trying to set up there. Um, and then we kind of have like, you know, uh, the, the data lake, data lake house formats, uh, you know, kind of Hootie data, Delta Lake and Iceberg, each of them kind of gave their talks and kind of motivations for, uh, their particular, uh, 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 table formats uh, for S3. And so uh, kind of talking through uh, what the motivations were and, and maybe will help you kind of make up your mind in terms of which one works better for your use cases. So really exciting uh, event. And uh, um, and so uh, definitely check out the recap there. It's linked in the show notes. Um, and without further ado, uh, I'm going to do something on the show that I, I haven't typically done, which is... Uh, that is to start off with the question of the episode. All right. So really mixing it up. What's the question? The question is, will Trino be making a vectorized C++ version of Trino workers? Uh, this has been asked to us a couple of times in the, in the recent uh, 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 past. And, and a lot of people on uh, Slack are kind of bringing this up because there are these frameworks uh, coming out of the woodwork um, that are basically looking to uh, uh, essentially focus on a vectorized comput computation model 
and it's all written in C++. And so, you know, the, the question comes in is like, well, is, uh, you know, this is a, like a lot, Long, long old uh, uh, kind of comparison battle with like, you know, C++ and frameworks versus, you know, Java and frameworks and C++ is faster and, but Java has, you know, more portability so and people say, blah, right? blah, blah. Like, I mean, so people say, and it's always dependent on the context, right? Yeah. So, so the answer that we have, I, I wanted to kind of have this so that we can kind of have like a, a broad answer for, for folks that are kind of wondering, wondering this. Uh, and so, uh, one thing is like, you know, so Trito has been around for now almost a decade and it is a very well established and very uh, elaborate uh, system uh, that has been, you know, been built for, for literally like, you know, a decade with multiple individuals, multiple companies involved. And, you know, taking something like that and just migrating it over to C++ is, is probably not super easy. I mean, I don't know. Was it pretty easy for you to just write Trino? I don't know. Uh, overnight, <laughs> Martin. Like, what what are your yeah. thoughts on like building out like the, you know essentially moving Trino from Java to C plus plus? I mean, it took us ten years to get to this point, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think mean, it's a general like that's it's it's kind of like just think about it like which complex software do you know that was ported and rewritten from scratch but compatible with the original version in a different language where that actually worked? I honestly don't know a single one. Like yeah. it ends up a completely yeah. different thing always, right? Yeah, yeah I mean the, the 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 thing is, it's a. I mean, doing that would be like a, a significant waste of effort. So you spend years. You, you would spend years doing that, and the only gain you might see is in one specific area of the code base, which is it's not clear that that's that's a a, a, a slam dunk in terms of a, an improvement. So you're gonna be you're going to be trying to replicate everything, like as Manfred's saying, like keeping everything compatible, all the everything bug for bug compatible. Uh, hopefully, like you don't introduce more bugs than, than you already have. Um, all the infrastructure around, and in the case of Trino, like all the connectors, all the APIs, all the uh, all the functions, like that. That's a lot of work. There's the surface area of Trino in in terms of code base is pretty large. So if you wanted to port that whole thing, you would take you it would take you several years, and you would start. Uh, you would end up at the point where we are right, we are right now. So you're you're going to be wasting a lot of um, a lot of uh, effort and time to to do that instead of advancing, continue to advance Trino uh, the way you could. So and you're saying that bare metals. The... Oh, go ahead. You would have to know Trino very well. You would have to know Java very well, and you would have to know C++ very well. That's not easy. Yeah, right, right. and you're saying that, like, you know, so essentially, we know it's hard, and you're saying the trade-off, uh, you know, of, of going through all that effort of like knowing C++, Java, and and Trino super well, and making that that move from one language to the other is not worth the bare metal speed that that people are implicating that you get out of moving to C++. No, I'm actually highly skeptical of the of those of those wins. I mean, often oftentimes those kinds of wins people talk about are due to architectural changes that you you know and learn from having been doing this for a long time. It's like yeah. the classic thing. Like, uh, well, when when we started building uh, Trino back in the day, we we didn't know what we were doing. Like, we were just basing off basing off of uh, research we found what in, our intu our intuitions in terms of how to build systems and so on a lot of things we learn along the way and there's a lot of legacy in there yeah uh, there's a lot of things that and, and obviously the, the use cases mutate might mutated over time so we learn new things in terms of okay if we want to do this we could have done it this way or that way so i mean in hindsight if we could if we could go back to i don't know 2012 when we started we probably would have would have come up with a different architecture for a lot, large portion of, of Trino like in terms of how the, the the internals of the engine operate and so on if we were to write it again we probably would do those things and if someone were to write it in a different language they would probably would do those things and that those are the kinds of changes that probably lead to a big improvements in in in, in performance flexibility and all that and and it's not you cannot do them. We we can we can uh, evolve the system to be able to um, rearchitect or re uh, or adapt the system to new use cases and new new patterns of doing things. And we are we're going to be working on that. But that doesn't mean that you have to throw everything away to to be able to um, to get to that point. 
Also, yes. I want to challenge one thing, and that is just because you're rewriting something and you're moving to a different ecosystem doesn't mean at all that it's going to be better. Yeah, it could be way worse. It could have lots of memory issues and what, like, it depends on the platform, right? Like, if you're going to port this, <laughs> you port Trino to Python, well, guess what? It's going to be slower. Like, it's an interpreted language that can be partly compiled, right? Yeah. Yeah. So just because you port to a different system that whoever ports thinks no, they know better doesn't actually mean it's going to be any better than, like, that's until you've Absolutely. done it, you don't know, right? So that's, yeah. that's a huge risk, right? Yeah. 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 So I think the, the takeaway and uh, the answer that was, was kind of, we, we give to folks is like, you know, so Java already actually, you know, you don't really necessarily need, and I think there's an implication here as well that like, you know, in order to, to do vectorization, right. You need to be in C plus plus or something like this. And that's not true at all. In fact, Java, uh, even uh, Java 11 already allows us to take advantage of uh, what's called auto vectorization, uh, which we'll, we'll cover here uh, in, in a little bit. And, um, and you basically get like a lot of the code that's just basically, as long as it's, you know, uh, written in the kind of correct way um, or essentially, you know, in, in a way where it can be uh, detected uh, for basically Java to say, hey, this is a, a loop that happens multiple times. And there's, you know, uh, this, this, the data that's going across is independent of each other essentially. So let's go ahead and, and run this as a parallel processing command versus you know an, an individual serial command. So, so okay, yeah, let me add a couple of things there. So, um, I mean, Java, you, you can write really fast Java code, really efficient Java code. You just need to under, you just need to know what the the JIT compiler is going to be doing. You have to have an intuition for what the JIT compiler is going to be doing. Like if you, mm -hmm. if you use um, uh, deep object hierarchies with uh, uh, multiple, like, I know, uh, yeah, you have uh, method dispatch with multiple targets. That that's, Those are the kinds of things that are going to make it harder to, for the VM to optimize. In some cases, it will have to do just method, normal method dispatch, and, and those are going to be inefficient. If you understand what, what the VM is doing, what the JIT compiler is doing, then you can write code to uh, work around those things. And, and of course, you wouldn't write all your code like this, but the most critical uh, piece of the, of, the, of the system, you can tune and you can architect and design so that it, they, it plays well with the, what the JIT compiler can do. Now, the advantage of Java is that you get all the benefits of, of a pretty flexible language, easy to program in. You have the benefits of garbage collection, uh, the huge ecosystem of libraries and, and, and so on that makes you not have to think much about all the other pieces that are not super critical. So you can yep. do both of, both of those things in one system. Uh, another, another important point is that when people talk about, oh, well, you, 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 have to run, you have to write vectorized code to be fast and so on. If you, if you look at what Trino is doing, and if you, if you do an analysis of, of where the time is spent in executing queries, um, there's only a small portion of the of the processing that can really benefit from vectorization. Um, there's just to give you an example. So when you when you're reading from you're right, let's say you're an aggreg aggregation query, uh, and I'll select from some table, group by something, compute some aggregations, and maybe some filters. Um, the majority of the time is going to be spent reading. Dec decompressing and decoding data from the underlying formats. Oftentimes, that's not computation that can be vectorized, like compression mm -hmm. algorithms, Z standard, LZ4, et cetera. Those are really hard to, uh, to uh, vectorize or, or benefit, benefit from vectorization. Uh, so that's not an area where, where um, uh, using SIMD or anything like that would help. Decoding, it depends on the decoding format. Some, some encodings are are, are more amenable to operations. Maybe some parts of the decoding can be done using vectorization, but not everything. Hmm. And then once you get into the into the, what the engine does, sure, there are operations like uh, arithmetic operations, etc., that you can probably do with uh, SIMD or, or or some other uh, GPUs, etc. But oftentimes, I mean, the majority of the of the of the queries that you see in the wild deal with parsing JSON, uh, parsing date formats matching regular expressions, mm -hmm. matching strings, like slicing and dicing strings. Like it's all this type of processing that is not, you, you can't, you can vectorize. So 
I, I, and then if, if you put everything together, then you, you end up with a small slice of the of the performance pie that can be optimized by vectorization. So even if you made that, I know, 10 times faster, it's not that your system is going to be 10 times better in terms yeah. of performance. It's going to be one, one small portion. So you have to take all those things into account and then consider, well, is it worth the investment of throwing everything we built over the last 10 years and redo it uh, in, a, in a new language? Yeah, that's a really good point. I I'd never actually considered the, you know, like how how you go from, you know, like what's the actual percentage of, of those uh like the payload basically. Yeah, what's what's the actual amount of, of workload that is actually going to benefit from this? I had never actually even thought through that. <laughs> and so you yeah. you have that number for if you were to like like ballpark a number, what what's like roughly the percentage that you would say is is benefiting from something like vectorization? I mean, it really depends on the workloads, but uh, I mean, for, I'm trying to remember uh, uh, when we were at Facebook, um, about 50% of the time was spent in the scan, filter, and project mm -hmm. operators. And mm -hmm. most of the time was spent in actual reading and decoding data from underlying storage. Mm -hmm. um, then the rest of the time was spent divided between joins, aggregations, and, and some other operators. So... It, like even if you make each of None those of operators processing, right? yeah, yeah, um, and then the and, and then in, in in terms of like what the operators were doing, a lot of the time was spent in in like I said, functions that are not vectorizable, like it's uh, JSON parsing, date manipulation, string manipulation, and so on. Hmm. Well, yeah. So I think so we... TLDR, the answer is we're not doing that. <laughs> we're not, we're not doing that. <laughs> And no, I, I, and, I, okay. and I, I, I'll say one, one more thing. Even, even if we decided to explore this, the approach would be not to rewrite the whole thing and throw, it, throw, out, throw away what we have and rewrite it from scratch, but figure out ways to slowly replace parts with um, something that's more efficient. And, and, and today, I mean, currently, it's hard to do um, interoperability within Java and C++ efficiently. There are a bunch of gotchas there. Um, it will be better in the future. Like there's there's a project Panama from uh, from the, the the Java community that is uh, aims at ma making the integration between Java and other languages much much uh, simpler, more efficient, uh, easier to deal with. So no more JNA, right? <laughs> JNA, JNA, yeah. all those those things are going to be much easier to deal with. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. It's cool. it's not even it's not even going through native stuff right? like those old native libraries, right? There's like a whole new thing that they're they're working on. Yeah, I mean, there is a whole ecosystem of, of uh, APIs, libraries, tools that, that they're working on. Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, so now I feel like uh, my my analogy is a little bit out of place now that we got into the serious version of this. But I I had a very hilarious analogy for this that I had to bring up now that you've already seen Usain Bolt. So uh, when we talk about you know when people bring up the C plus plus Java thing to me, I like to bring up this analogy of like okay. I think of C++ and Java as kind of like, you know, the two fastest men in the world, which is Usain Bolt and, and Johan Blake. And a lot of people don't know, necessarily like remember Johan Blake's name or even know who he is until like you, you say he's the second fastest man in the world, uh, unless you pay attention to the Olympics. And so, uh, so when I think about, you know, both of these two languages uh, and, and the analogy falls short at, at some level, but just to get us started, you know, you think about, these two guys are like literally the fastest, fastest men in the world. And uh, they're, they're a part of each other by like seconds. And another thing that a lot of people don't know about Johan Blake is that he's beat Usain Bolt in a couple races before. So in the same way that, you know, C++ and Java are, are not necessarily like, you know, may, yeah, maybe in certain context or particular, uh, you know, type of uh, runnings. I mean, again, like Usain Bolt, maybe there was like a, he had he had the wrong kind of food the day before, you know, and so his stomach wasn't feeling great. So he lost to Johan Blake that day, or Johan Blake just you know took the extra ex extra spice. So that's that's literally like you know the difference that could make it between Java running faster and C plus plus running faster, the context that you run in, right? So so uh, what I like to think about is like where we're trying to focus our efforts on in Trino. Um, in a lot of ways, is not necessarily this bare metal speed, which is, in the end of the day, with these these runners, what they're trying to optimize on is their 
bare metal speed, who gets across the front line the, uh, uh, at the end of the day. But there's so many other complexities around languages and frameworks uh, that we've already discussed here today that is kind of like makes the the question of, you know, it's not just about bare metal speed. It, so my closest analogy is what if we, you know, if, if we're started focusing on things like, you know, how is the is, is the uh, optimizer actually doing uh, the correct, you know, generating the the most optimal plan, because uh, essentially what this would look like in in our uh, Usain Johan Blake analogy is that imagine these two are running on a 400 meter dash, and or sorry, 100 meter dash on a 400 meter track, and you are just telling, you know, yeah, sure, maybe Usain Bolt's faster, but you tell him to run the, you know, in the wrong direction. Well, essentially, you know, you know who's going to win that one. It's going to be Johan Blake every single time. So what we're trying to do is focus on other areas and, and really di dive in deep in terms of what is the query engine doing? What is the query engine, you know, do wasting its time? Is it spinning on, uh, you know, up on uh, incorrect things during runtime? Are there new things that we can learn to basically make a better query plan? And that's uh, some of the things that we'll we'll talk about later. But ultimately, we want to make sure that our query engine is moving in the right direction versus thinking through just raw speed all the time. So some, I, I want to just basically, you know, have this kind of moment to think, you know, it's, it, there are, it's a multi speed and performance when it comes to query engines is a, is a multi-dimensional, very high dimensional uh, problem and things to think through. And, you know, Martin and Manfred, uh, you, you all said it beautifully. I just need, was here to bring in the hilarious uh, running analogy. So, <laughs> Anyways, with all that being said, uh, I think we that sets us up pretty well for uh, the concept of the episode. All right, so concept of the episode. A uh, couple things coming up. I mean, the big the big two is like uh, we are about to update to to Java seventeen. So. Martin, uh, could you kind of give us an idea of like where we're at with this and uh, what's what's the holdup? Uh, any an anticipation in terms of maybe not a date yet, or I don't know if we do have a date in mind. Uh, but what's what's going on in this uh, this PR? Yeah. So what we've been doing is uh, we've been slowly uh, trying to get uh, Trina to run uh, in Java 17. There's uh, a few few compatibility issues. There's some. Third-party libraries that are not don't place nicely with Java 17 because of um, specifically because they were using API internal APIs to Java that have been removed in Java 17. Mm -hmm. So we've been slowly working, uh, doing, uh, making our way through updating those libraries to remove those dependencies or or change them with something that that, that works in in fine in 17. Mm -hmm. So the um, I think we're pretty close. I think there are a couple of connectors that still have problems. The core of Trino does work with Java 17. Once we we finalize those those uh, remaining connectors, the idea will be to start running all the tests in the CI directly on, on 17. They let that happen for a while. Have people start trying Java 17 on on their production system testing uh, or the on their QA testing systems, wherever they want. Make sure that there are no issues, and then at that point we'll say, "Okay, uh, we are good with 17. We're gonna update the uh, compilation time to use Java 17 uh, uh, compiler, and then eventually be able to start taking advantage of features in, in in the language." But but it already works with 17 now, mostly, right? Yeah, it's only a couple of connectors that have problems and. Uh, I I don't recall exactly which ones. I I, I can go dig it it's up. It's like HBase. <laughs> and there was something with Phoenix. Phoenix. Yeah, there was something with Phoenix. I don't know if we finally I addressed think most those. of those are fixed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. But but essentially, as a call out to the community, try with seventeen now. Yeah. Literally, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 And if if you have find issues, please report them. Like uh, the, the the more we can get ahead of the curve here, the the easier it will be to. Uh, finalize the migration. Yeah, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like we are already using Java 17 uh, Starburst in Starburst Galaxy at least, right? Yeah, I mean we we have a, a limited set of connectors that we run. Yeah, now, but yeah. yeah. So so like limited set of connectors in this case includes Hive, SQL Server, right. uh, Maria, uh, sorry, MySQL, a bunch of those kind of PostgreSQL. So. If you're on that sort of like standard stuff, then you probably be all right. So, and if not, and you find out that you're not, let us know. That would be awesome. 
Yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, my hope is that what we talk about today and, and tell people about today in terms of uh, the the performance and uh, all the different goodies that are coming with Java 17, it'll motivate you all to uh, to, to take us up on that. So let me see if I can get this uh, pulled out. Okay, so if you go to this, uh, the way I've laid out this uh, um, these notes is like Java 17 updates. I have a little link here. This actually takes us to all of the JEPs uh, that have that have basically come out since Java 11. So this is literally going from uh, Java 11, that one that essentially the version that we're currently on in uh, Trino, and uh, and then getting us up to uh, Java 17. And so um, so there's a lot to talk about here. Let's uh, let's just start jumping in with uh, with performance. So I literally put. There are several JEPs that improve performance. Like all of those are, are different <laughs> performance uh, JEPs that if you want to go click on them individually. So what's a JEP, Ryan? I actually don't know what the acronym stands for, to be honest. It's a Java. The Java <laughs> Enhancement <laughs> Enhan Proposal, I think. Proposal. Okay. Nice. So, um, uh, by the way, th those uh, all those things you, you mentioned, improvements, are they are captured in JEPs, but there are tons of changes, small changes that are not capturing jobs, like uh, just bug fixes, bug uh, and whatever minor improvements that have, have been happening since Java 11 that will not, you will not be able to see in that list. Yep, and you can, do, for, for more of those, you can actually hop onto, they have like a, a, a public little like Jira board-ish, I think it's a Jira board thing, and you could just go in and actually like they, like search for whatever kind of feature that you're looking for and it's pretty easy to look for through that stuff. But uh, but for, for simplicity and to kind of like, you know, get the high level ticket items that uh, that were pushed across, um, you know, we, we will obviously, so this is why I say, as well as many small changes to the GVM, because there's just a whole bunch of like little individual ones that are not necessarily captured by the JEPs. And so the easiest way uh, to kind of, when it, when it comes to performance, right? Performance is super multifaceted. You have throughput, you have latency, you have memory footprint, you have startup time, you have ramp up time, you have pause times, you have shutdown times, right? Like all these different elements of, of, of things that could affect like what you perceive as performance or how fast a query runs or something like that. Um, or, or running out of memory, especially is like, you know, one that we've been, we've been uh, hitting head on with Project Tardigrade recently. But uh, all of these affect the performance of, of the query engine at the end of the day. And so um, there are uh, a lot of people who kind of go out and do these like standardized, uh, you know, Java application benchmarks to showcase how the performance increased. Now that's not necessarily going to reflect how good the performance will, will be in Trino's case, but it is a good kind of idea of, of how things are improving. And so um, the, uh, the, this one we're actually going to see, I uh, have a couple benchmarks down below that, uh, that some of the Oracle folks did, and we'll look at those, but, um, <clears throat> particularly for performance, I thought there was, it was interesting to see that, you know, some people in the Java community, and I think we should start doing this, basically take their Java application and then they run various small micro benchmarks, some small parts of their system and, uh, and essentially determine, you know, kind of the speed. Uh, or essentially the the overall boost in performance that they get between different JDK elements. I think this would be a uh, something I actually kind of want to try to invest some time in uh, to to do some of these for for Trino in particular. So uh, essentially, you know, these what these individual things kind of like break down to be are specific to this Opta Planner. They have like cloud balancing, machine reassignment, course scheduling, exam scheduling, nurse rostering. I don't know what I'm guessing. These are very specific to the application. And in general, when you look at, you know, when they're comparing running these same operations in JDK 11 to JDK 17, um, the blue ones here uh, are, are showing the the increase or decrease in performance. It looks like for one of their particular things they run, there was a it was actually a significant decrease. But for all the rest, they see uh, in the in the aggregate uh, what they uh, claim is a 8.66 percent speed uh, when they're using the G1 garbage collector. And, and that's so, the default one, right? Yeah, uh, that's the default uh, garbage collector, and that is the one I believe we're using. You know, like at least in our our suggested settings for yeah. Um, yeah. The one so we recommend for for Trina, yeah. The one we recommend as well, yeah. Um, 
And so, uh, Martin, uh, you actually did uh, a set of micro benchmarks earlier last year. Um, you said it's 10 to 15% improvement speed. Could you just kind of, I, I want to eventually take these and, and run these and get these publicized, but uh, at some point, could you just kind of talk through uh, the benchmarks that you were running, how you split things apart, and, and, and what you were seeing in terms yeah, of these this, were uh, some, performance? These were some uh, micro benchmarks we have in the Trino code base for uh, uh, testing different parts of the system. Like we have some, I don't know, whenever we, whenever we make a change to something that is performance sensitive, we add a, a micro benchmark using JMH. And um, I, I think these ones I run were for some of the core operators, like the scans, uh, filters, projections, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I tried them both in Java 11 and Java 17, and, and there was a difference in performance of about 10 to 15 percent. Wow! Um, is that those that that bench to driver stuff? No, no, no. This is JMH. It's a oh, simple okay. JMH uh, micro benchmark. So of, of course, it doesn't mean that if you run in 17, you'll see 10 to 15 per percent improvement in performance overall. But some parts are going to be more efficient. Yep. Um, so I mean, it's very, very uh, encouraging. So I mean, we need to do more testing of, of, of Trino overall to to see uh, how much we can get. But but yeah, I mean, it's it shows that there are so many improvements in 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 the JVM, the JDK, and the, and the garbage collector, JIT compiler uh, over the last few years that there are noticeable performance improvements. Yeah, and these could be anything from like that uh, the auto vectorization piece that we were talking about before. Maybe they are tra you know tracking those better, or maybe it's something along the lines of like efficient memory usage or or uh, removing uh, kind of managing a whole bunch of extra uh, you know data in the in the heap or something like that when it really is not being used or something. Yeah, it could be JIT compiler optimizations. Like uh, the JIT compiler is a compiler, so over the years they they optimize certain patterns better than others, and and you'll see those improvements. So it could be just it generates better code. Yeah. So getting to uh, uh, another big element, and usually this is kind of nudged underneath performance, but it is also uh, I'd say because there were so many big changes in this area that it kind of deserved its own section. So garbage collectors, which is a, a very big part, anybody who's not familiar in terms of like, uh, you know, J Java in particular, if you come, you might even come from, you know, .NET or some other uh, kind of uh, uh, language or framework that, that also has a garbage collector. Essentially what these things do is, 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 uh, it, it, it's one of these uh, really nice ways of abstracting away the memory management so that essentially like when we're developing on Trino, we don't have to think about, you know, uh, deallocating some data and memory. It just kind of happens automatically for us, right? And so one of the biggest problems performance-wise Java had faced early on were that these garbage collectors actually, uh, they call them stop the world pauses, where they actually just stop everything going on in an application and uh, do a what's called a scan to see what data, essentially what uh, what memory in the heap is no longer needed anymore. And so there's a whole bunch of optimizations in terms of like you know what is being done. Uh, basically, moving a lot of these garbage collectors to be done and concurrently versus having to actually stop uh, the applications that are running, so that essentially you can do those garbage scans iteratively at at the exact same time that the um, uh, that that the uh, uh, that the co collector is going through, or yeah, you can run your app while the collector is going through. Um, G one is kind of a hybrid. It kind of does a little bit of like you know does some marking. Essentially, what is it does is it goes out and tags things concurrently and saying, hey, this is something that we don't need anymore in the in the heap, and so let's get rid of it on the next sweep. And so the marking can be done in parallel, but still the the uh, the actual um, there's a, there's still an actual pause whenever the scan goes through to to remove uh, those those things. And so there are two fully concurrent garbage collectors that have been proposed uh, in the meantime, one called ZGC and the other called Shenando. And uh, and so these both I, I, there's a lot of similarities, but it's just the specific underlying algorithms uh, between these two. And I think also Shenando can actually go back to Java 8, which doesn't really matter for us. So, um, so, so these two are, I think, are super exciting potential things that I don't know. Have have we, have we done any tests or looked into, you know, uh, bringing in either of these two concurrent process or garbage collectors? 
No, I, we haven't done any formal testing. Uh, I think there was some some testing with ZGC on Java 11. Uh, there, there was there was a regression performance, but that again, it's Java 11, so things have changed significantly since then. Yeah. Uh, so we we need to run tests again, uh, and people need to run mm. and try it out in, in on their workloads and see if uh, there's any improvement. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. If you, if you, I mean, Z, it's, it sounds with the people who are, who, who preach about it, who, who talk about these concurrent garbage collectors, they, they, they sound really excited about it and it gets me really excited. So, uh, I, I'm actually really curious to see over time if, if this is something we would incorporate into, uh, making a more standard in Trino, uh, and, and seeing what people are, are reporting, uh, by using this. So please do use one of these two. Uh, if not, like, I'm not sure if, uh, one's preferable over the other. Uh, but, uh, but they, they are really exciting. Um, just want to chime in a little bit on the, on that as well. Like one sure. thing that you need to consider is that like, typically these garbage collection pauses are not like, like noticeably huge for like, mm -hmm. unless you're actually benchmarking, it's not like Trina will stop processing and you won't like, this is yeah. across the cluster. Right. And it gets more. And, and one of the aspects that exposes Trina a bit more to that is that the pauses for for large garbage collections become significantly bigger the more garbage you have, which means the higher your memory and your la, la, larger your JVM is that it runs on. And Trino is exposed to that because our architecture is so that we have lots of threads, lots of memory on a on, on smaller, very large nodes, right? Like yeah. typically our workers have a lot of memory or should have a, quite a lot of memory and process a lot a lot of data right so we we are a bit more exposed to that and that that's why it can be helpful to uh, have a look on those garbage collectors so so the 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 performance of the garbage collector is generally correlated with the complexity of the object dra graphs that your application deals with yeah. so if you if you have a, a hundred gigabytes of memory and you allocate i know 10 objects, of, well, you can do 10 gigabytes each, but uh, let's say you allocate 100 objects of one gigabyte each, then that's going to be trivial to garbage collect. It's like walk 10, 10 objects, decide whether they, they can be free or not. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have a million objects, they are highly linked to each other, then the garbage collector is going to have to walk all those references, going to have to walk all those objects, and that's that's when it, when when things can, can take more time. Hmm. Uh, in Trino, in general, we try to be careful, very careful for the critical sections uh, of the system to not allocate lots of tiny objects that are highly interconnected and so on. We allocate bigger regions, buffers, and so on. Uh, there are cases where uh, that's unavoidable, uh, especially when we, we're using third-party libraries for some functions, like if you use, um, I know, uh, they say the geometry functions. That's a library that we didn't write ourselves and, and it's very object oriented. So you're dealing with with objects and, and reference and all that. And that can have an impact. That's so, like the geospatial stuff, basically? Yeah, geospatial. Where you have lots of yeah. points and like references. Yeah, and, yeah. exactly. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, How much is that also affected by the fact like, um, you know, like I typically when you work with like object storage connectors and stuff like that, um, it's always one of those things where it's better to have fewer larger files. Does that also impact it? So if you like, rather than having like in a storage, you have lots of small files. Does that also have an impact that it goes all the way down to the garbage collector? Or does that really not go that deep? Generally not that big of a deal uh, because, well, I mean, what's going to happen is each file is going to uh, have a handle and have a handle associated with it. Um, there's, in, in Trino, there will be a split associated with it. So that, that means more objects, but generally those objects are not very connected to other objects. So they're right. easy to easy walk to through. Okay. Uh, they are also not like millions and millions, they are thousands. So th those mm -hmm. are the kinds of things that the, the, the collector can do, can walk over very quickly. It's quite kind of impressive when you say, well, it's only a couple of, it's a couple of, it's just thousands and thousands, no big deal, right? Like, <laughs> no, I mean, just, so just think, think about how, how fast can you loop through a, a list of a thousand elements, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I know. But like, that's like, just think of it, like, that's that's impressive, right? Like the JVM is like, well, you know, tens and tens of thousands, no big deal, right? Like, let's talk millions and more, otherwise it's not worth like anything, like performance, <laughs> it's just going to be perfect, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's good to keep those like have those rough numbers in mind, especially when 
you know, folks like the maintainers have to keep this stuff in their heads, right? Of, of like, what's the, the how's the implementa implementation going to affect, you know, garbage collection and all yeah. these other elements in the JVM? It's a it's a hard task. Exactly, and 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 there are things that we did in in Trino that that make it make it work well, or at least play well with G one. Uh, G one uh, splits the the memory into regions. The regions can be of variable size up to 32 megabytes. Mm -hmm. We actually recommend using 32 megabyte regions. And, and then we size objects so that they fit or try to size allocations so they fit in those regions because otherwise you trigger uh, what's called humongous allocations that can handle differently by G1 and, and have other uh, potential performance issues. So, so it's like we, we do write the software to play well with the garbage collector. And, mm. and that's our consideration when we when we try other garbage collectors, we need to understand how do those garbage collectors think, how they how they operate, and 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 we may need to do different make different trade offs in the in the system. We want if we're gonna adopt one of those as a as a primary uh, recommendation. Yeah, and I do on on that note too. If anybody is really interested in this, uh, I I do have a couple of links here in the show notes, uh, particularly around uh, you know learning Java garbage collection in the last 10 releases. So this was actually a really cool talk uh, by Oracle. And then uh, this this concurrent garbage collectors actually compares ZGC and Shenandoah. So it gives a lot of good, uh, a lot of good uh, in-depth uh, about, uh, you know, what's, um, uh, what, what, what to uh, kind of understand how these work differently from, from G1 in particular. So, um, so yeah, so that, that's really cool. Any, anything else before we kind of go, there's a, uh, a benchmark in particular, but is there anything else we want to say in terms of uh, uh, how how this works or how how Trino essentially works with garbage collectors? That no, should yeah, I was going to say one thing. So uh, people like there used to be well the, in the VM there's two types of garbage collectors. What they call the uh, parallel stop the world type of collectors, like batch collectors, and then mm -hmm. the 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 real time online online collectors, uh, low latency collectors like G1 and ZGC and all that. Mm -hmm. And people ask, well, if, if Trino is a system that is just processing data in, in like in bulk and in batches, like why do you care about a low latency collector? Uh, why not use one of the parallel collectors and just let it, let, let it collect when it has to collect, pause when it has to pause, and at the end of the day, all you care about is the uh, latency or the end-to-end -end latency of your query, not not. Uh, you don't care about it's not like you're dealing with an interactive application where you click on something and you need a response immediately and you can mm -hmm. wait five seconds at that point um the and the answer to that is that yes that is true that trino process did, did in bulk and all that but it is a uh, complex distributed system that is sensitive to timeouts when nodes are talking to each other um there's timeouts inside trino in in in, in the core so those timeouts are affected by pauses in the garbage collector. So if, if one worker is trying to get data from another worker and the, the other worker pauses for, say, five minutes because mm -hmm. it's processing uh, its 100 gigabyte heap and walking everything and marking and stuff and, yeah, and collecting, then, well, you're going to have a timeout. And timeout means a failure or a, at least a retry. So it, the, the times compound and, and your queries are, uh, eventually take longer or, or eventually fail. Yeah, gotcha. Is there is there any also consideration to like regarding the the uh, immediate speed of of the query um, that like would be involved when you're saying working with a real time system like Pino, you know, because essentially you're probably you're likely trying to at least go for near real time uh, in those instances, and that also would would affect the the speeds around uh, uh, essentially when we're when we're uh, directly talking to like brokers of, of the uh, of, of Pino or Druid or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, if you're if you're if you're trying to run super low latency queries, and in Trino you can run queries that take a hundred milliseconds. Like we we actually had a system at Facebook that uh, was backed by 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 Trino, and and it was user facing, and queries took uh, around that time, hundred milliseconds, fifty milliseconds sometimes. And of course, if you if you if your storage system or your underlying system you're querying is fast, and and your queries are simple enough that they can take uh such a short time then any pauses in the garbage collector is gonna is potentially gonna affect that that um duration significantly compared to what the time you actually take executing the query 
like if your query is 100 milliseconds and you pause for two seconds, well, now you multiply your execution yeah. time by 20x, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I always think through those two because that's that's actually been you know uh, one of the large not larger but like a, a kind of plus bonus whenever people are you know trying to say well first thing is kind of the replace hive one but then the other use case that they're constantly thinking through is how do we bring real time you know and kind of merge these two these two uh, worlds and Trino is used for that in so many uh, elements but I don't think that anybody's wanting to just bring in a real-time system thinking, oh yeah, it's fine if it takes, you know, <laughs> two seconds to, to, to come back with this query. <laughs> it's, you're essentially wanting some near real-time at the, at the, uh, at the least. So, so cool. That's a, uh, that's good to think through some of those things. So I just wanted to quickly point out, there's this, uh, really cool, um, a, a lot of these really cool blogs that are put out by a lot of the Oracle people, um, uh, and, uh, and Java people in general. And so I like this one, uh, d uh, done by, um, um, oh gosh, his name is literally just here a second ago. What is it? Uh, done by yes, Stefan Joh Johansson. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, um, he, uh, he basically just took this, uh, this, this common benchmark, the, uh, spec JVB and, uh, and ran it through, uh, different of the last couple LTSs. And so it's, uh, so I'm basically just pulling a lot of these graphs from, from his blog, uh, and just putting a little of my commentary around just a couple of them. But in general, if you're looking at the, the different elements, right, where, uh, where throughput in terms of how much garbage collection can do, uh, and how much actual, uh, uh, processing that garbage collection is doing, um, when we look at G1, ZGC in parallel, um, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing, uh, about, I would say about the same uh, type of in increase, uh, obviously a little more with, with ZGC. And you don't see, obviously, JDK8 for ZGC because it wasn't there yet. Um, and so um, so that, again, you know, you're just... Is that getting... the one that was that came out of Zulu? Um, I am not sure if that came out with... I, I know it came out specifically with... Uh, uh, with with JDK eleven, uh, mm -hmm. and and it was it was not it was in an incubator I think with JDK eleven, so it was possible, yeah. but it wasn't actually like in the in, in, in production. In fact, actually, they don't think ZGC or Shenando became production u uh, usable until like the last two, the okay. last two. Yeah, yeah. Z ZGC I think is primarily driven by Oracle and Shenando by Red Hat. Okay. Mm. Got it. Yeah, and I think uh, Red Hat was like their big goal was to make it backwards compatible for for different reasons. So, um, cool. So uh, then you know latency. Um, we're we're seeing again. You know, higher is better. Uh, that essentially we're uh, expecting lower latency queries uh, coming from uh, these the the speed in which the um, the garbage collector is able to actually uh, uh, execute, and then. We are, uh, the thing that I really wanted to zoom in on were these uh, pause times that we were talking about before. And so what are the actual expectations around the, the pause times that, that we come to expect? Obviously, this is within the benchmark. So, you know, it, this will heavily vary, heavily vary depending on what we're actually running. But uh, if you look across parallel G1, ZGC, uh, you know, you're seeing... G1 is is you know just around 100 milliseconds uh, for these, and so I'm really interested to see actually what you know for for different operations that we actually run in Trino, uh, if we can actually pull real numbers for this for what we're actually seeing uh, today. But you know this is still a good benchmark to compare across uh, the different JDK versions, and uh, you know you do see these uh, relatively uh, big drops. But I think the one that gets me super excited for the G ZGC is the potential that yeah we could we could potentially see anything from 0 0.1 millisecond uh, delays in these pauses and this is all really due to that uh, concurrent running of the uh, 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 of the deallocation um, uh, bits there and they've just uh, really um, you know put a, put a lot of extra effort into um, uh, making that non non uh, for, um, non intrusive. Uh, then obviously, you know, we're looking at, uh, the peak memory, uh, ZGC is surprisingly, you know, uh, higher than I, I was expecting, you know, it is, uh, still, uh, I'm guessing because it's, it's able to do so much, 
uh, and do it super quickly. It's it's a bit of a memory hog in comparison to G1. But looking at uh, G1 in terms of uh, its memory footprint, this is one kind of cool slope that I like to see in terms of like going from JDK to J17. But uh, there's another uh, graph that I saw, uh, which actually put this in, in even a better context. So if you look at JDK8, uh, and they you know run ran, use this uh, big RAM tester uh, uh, test to go using G1 across you know everything from JDK8 all the way to 18. So these are the three that we just saw up here, and that roughly shows kind of what we're expecting. We go from six gig, four gig in JDK11, and now we're actually cutting that in half uh, yet again. And so it's uh, well not again, but <laughs> cutting it in half in this particular jump from JDK11 to J JDK17. Uh -huh. So it's it's uh, the the implications here are that you know uh, this this is going to relieve a lot uh, of of, uh, pro uh, of of memory space essentially a lot of the things that we run into in terms of running out of resources in Trino um, you know moving moving from uh, JDK eleven to JDK seventeen so I think this is this gap right here should be one of the biggest reasons why you should be like oh my gosh we should be it's quite amazing when you look at that chart. Seven. And it's like for 20 gigabyte heap and then eight gig on our G1 native memory usage. Yeah. And it drops down to one. And what I'm surprised, and I didn't realize that is they must have done some significant change again from 17 to 18 already. Yeah. Like it drops again a lot. Almost right? a half. Yeah. It's like literally half and half in this one. This one a two is already big, big, right? But then another two gig drop yeah. in terms of average usage. It's 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 pretty pretty cool. So it's hopefully we'll see similar results in certain certain aspects of, of Trino as well, uh, moving to JDK7. But uh, that got me super excited when I saw this this particular graph uh, for the uh, for the G1 garbage collector. Cool. Uh, so we're we're uh, we're hitting the hour now. So let's uh, let's keep moving on. So Vector API um, just hit its second incubator status uh, in JDK17, and so um, I wanted to quickly before we hop into like exactly Vector API, I wanted to actually talk about like what is auto vectorization. So uh, Daniel Strecker wrote this awesome, super awesome blog uh, that basically goes into uh, a lot of these details. Uh, so definitely check out this this blog, uh, and if you're wanting to uh, essentially get um, uh, more more context into this. But the example that he uses here is is I think super valuable and something fun to even just run on your own. So he has this uh, uh, small class uh, to run this benchmark, and essentially just uh, uh, goes creates a for loop that calls this uh, method that yet again has yet another for loop, and this is uh, essentially you know, each of these instructions, each of these multiplication instructions, basically just squaring some some value in this uh, array and then returning it back to the original value. Um, this is, uh, um, you know, an instruction that can be executed uh, across multiple, uh, you know, in par multiple par parallel sets of instructions. So you could think of this going across threads. Uh, this could also go across, uh, you know, uh, different instruction sets. Uh, like that we'll, we'll be, you know, looking at too in terms of the, the, the core hardware. So what he does in this blog is he basically uh, compiles this and runs it with the compile command with uh, the uh, uh, print, print compile command. And uh, that, well, I can even show it to you here. I just didn't want to put it in the notes uh, to have too much stuff. But basically, this spits out the, uh, the bytecode and... He points out the specific uh, execution or the specific instruction. Um, uh, no, sorry, not the bytecode. This is the actual uh, yes, um, as assembly code. Um, and so this is the actual uh, assembly command that gets generated whenever you're not using auto vectorization. So uh, it stands for multiply scalar single precision. When you turn on auto vectorization uh, or run it with auto vectorization, then you have uh, VMULPS, which is multiply packed single precision, which is that uh, the SIMD instruction uh, that gets used alternatively. So that's auto vectorization. That's like what we have today. And Java is able to determine this because again, he kind of has this comment here, repeatedly invoke the method under test. This causes JIT compiler to optimize the method. So so that's that's a, you know, essentially taking what we are doing in, in Trino, uh, you know, uh, super like 
super smart people that understand uh, the the JVM super well and how the JIT compiler does things like Martin and, and a whole bunch of our uh, uh, super talented folks on uh, the maintainer group understand, hey, th we need to basically, uh, when, when Martin says this, let's make the loops tighter. This is what he's talking about, right? Um, do you have anything to kind of expand upon there, Martin, that I'm maybe missing in terms of nuance there? Yeah, it's basically like you need to make sure that the, the loops, when you say loops are tight, it's like, um, for example, there, there are some there are some optimizations that, that the JIT compiler does, and, and some of these are changing. For, for example, if you have a, a, a loop over an integer variable with a constant stride and, uh, and a constant limit, the, the, the VM can can generate code without it, it can avoid in certain 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 kinds of uh checks in the middle of the loop those checks can be expensive yeah uh if you have method invocations like if you, you want those method, method invocations to have a single target like put uh for example a static method or or a method with a single uh if it's an interface or a or a, or a, a, a track method uh, a, a method that has a single target in practice, uh, because mm -hmm. otherwise it becomes what's called a, a, a megamorphic or bimorphic uh, call site, and the VM has a harder time optimizing those and ends up having to dispatch. What you want is the, the VM to inline all that bytecode and generate one compact uh, uh, piece of uh, native code. Nice. And, and that, 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 that's basically, uh, that's what it means to, to make it loops tighter in that sense. When, when you, uh, when you do that, are you usually like actually do, running this kind of command and generating that code to see, you know, like, or, or is it, or does that vary every single time depending on the query? Well, it, it varies. I mean, you can't, it, so it, it's got a double edged sword because you can say, well, if I write the code in this way, uh, I have an intuition that the VM will do the right thing, but you can't really count on it every single time. Like, the VM will do, for example, if you have a, a, a method that invokes a bunch of other methods, the VM will decide on its own which methods is going to inline or not based on the frequency of invocation and other factors. Hmm. So if you if you are expecting or you are hoping for all of them to be in line, then I know in one version may of the of the VM may do one thing, a different version may have different thresholds, it may do a diff something different. So you hmm. can't rely on it, but you you build an intuition of, of these are patterns that will make it better or worse. And then you go and measure it. You run micro benchmarks uh, and, and you generate the assembly and look at the assembly and see, or is, is it actually doing uh, method calls? Is it inserting all the all these uh, checks in the middle? Like, and what's causing that? And you can tweak the, the code a little bit to make it, uh, make it better. Of course, this uh, is not something that you do all the time. You think about all the time, but when, when it matters, like, you have to look at it. And then there, so you got to a, a really interesting point of saying like, you know, so you can't always expect the, essentially the, the compiler to do what you're expecting it to do. Right. So if we take vector API, uh, you know, this is kind of why I think vector API has come to the forefront is that there are people who now want to have a little more control over, right. you know, how, how that happens. So, um, I, I'm going to, you know, so we, I think we pretty much understand the intuition as to why you would want vector API, because now you can actually have a lot more fine grained control over exactly how this happens. Um, and do you think this is something that we'll want to invest in? Um, like we, we would want to invest in from the Trino side or, uh, you know, is that, is it, I know there's a lot of times where when you try to over optimize the problem, it's like you're, you're actually becoming a bit of getting in the way of the compiler and mm -hmm. trying maybe doing too many problems. Like, is that, typically the case here or do you think there's a lot of areas where it makes sense that we actually once this be, now that this is becoming available to us that we should start you know investing in and start using the vector api no there, there are lots of places where we could use it today uh there's actually I, I was i was running some some benchmarks last year that um I, and there are there are certain operations that we do over arrays like so you're you're doing some i don't know processing masks uh, or, or converting from, I don't know. Uh, so inside the engine, we, we, we use arrays all the time, like for very specific operations. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, using the vector, vectorization APIs can have a significant improvement. Like there was one case where I saw, it was like a 20x improvement for one method. It doesn't mean that everything gets faster, but just that one method gets faster by using this vector API. Um, and then in the core engine, there, there is opportunity for taking advantage of the vector APIs when we're dealing with 
um, arithmetic operations, comparisons, like basic simple operations that, that can be expressed in terms of um, the, the underlying vector or SIMD instructions that the CPU pro, uh, offers. That requires um, re-architecting uh, parts of Trino in terms of how the operators work, how the, the operators uh, reason about expressions and applying expressions to the data. And, but once we have that, we, now, we, we have the flexibility to either apply the, the use the vector APIs or do it in, in normal Java code or potentially do something else. Like eventually we might want to explore using GPUs for some, some processing. Yeah. And is that, so from my understanding, Vector API is for like helping us tap, tap into SIMD, but does these, do these also help us tap like potentially into, like, is there a way to tap that into GPUs or, or how do we actually do the GPU part? I, I no, saw we connected G that. Yeah, so GP, so Vector API uh, is a front end for SIMD instructions in different processors effectively. Like it's, it. it's abstract enough, but it's, it, it, that's effectively what it does. For mm -hmm. GPU, we would need to use a separate libraries that, know how to interact with uh, GPU. There's um, I know CUDA and other libraries that can take advantage of. Yeah. And you wouldn't be using the same APIs, but we, after we end up restructuring how the operators work, what's behind the execution of, of the operator can be implemented using the vector API or using a GPU specific API or using plain Java code or, or and Whatever. and depending on the context, it'll it'll Trino will know to choose with the correct implementation. I assume. Then. Right, right. I mean, yeah. again, this is all very speculative at this point. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it also has huge effects on deployment times and stuff like that, right? Because then you would have to decide: well, do you want a machine that has that right. sort of like design? Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. The cool. nice thing about the vector API is that. Um, it, it, it has a, a level of abstraction where you can you can run write that code and then it will it will be able to compile to different CPUs like Intel or ARM and 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 then in the cases where it can't um, run on on some platform it will fall back to doing the the loops in the normal way so mm -hmm. so it's as if you had written the Java code in the normal way yeah that's that's super cool I mean obviously yeah that. You would almost expect that, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, it's good that that happens, <laughs> or else it just like just blows up. <laughs> uh, cool. Any other thing before we hop onto the language features? All right. I think it's. I th I'm actually really excited about Vector API. I think there's a lot of potential <laughs> there. My only like kind of small concern, I guess, with it is that like, uh, you know, in terms of maintenance, right? Like, what does that add in terms of the maintenance? But it sounds like if we refactor it the right way, do the typical kind of like, you know, Java modularization, it shouldn't be too hard to to maintain. Um, so language features. Uh, so this, you know, kind of hits more people who are implementing uh, and actually contributing to to Trino, uh, uh, or or anybody who's just writing anything in Java these days. But uh, uh, but this is uh, a lot of really exciting stuff when it comes to like. Uh, I think I think in particular a lot of our tests for this first one, uh, we have a whole bunch of tests that you know has SQL, it has JSON, it has like a, a, you know, particularly I think JSON because of my Elasticsearch tests and and things like that. And so when you uh, when you have a lot of the uh, traditional like uh, kind of one dimensional literal strings that you want to kind of represent the way that they're that these strings are represented in like a text file you you end up look getting something that looks like this so you'll you'll need to make sure you do escapes you need to, you know for for the quotation marks you'll need to make sure that uh, anytime there's a a new line that's that would be in the actual document that you do a dash n and this just becomes ridiculously hard to read and a lot of times you you may accidentally put a you know, sneak a uh, character that's not supposed to be in there, and it ends up, you know, throwing off a test or or doing something really <laughs> funky, right? Um, or in, in not even in the context of testing, this could even be, you know, real real code that goes to production, right? So, uh, so it's just making this simpler to read was uh, is, is a big deal, a more big deal than maybe it it seems at at face value, and so. Uh, so multi-line text box uh, was one of these things that was added. I don't remember exactly uh, which version. This was in 15. Yeah, 15 or 15, yeah. 15, I yeah. Think, I think it's important to point out that these, like now we're talking about language features. So up to now, we talked about just adopting Java 17 as a runtime. 
which yeah. you can do now, you can test now, you can play around. Our next steps will be to make it so that the required runtime is Java 17. And when we do that, then we can also change the compilation level to that language. And that's when the language features can come in place because it will make our maintenance of the code base easier because Much we can easier. take advantage of these clean features. Yeah, yeah, good, good way. To, I didn't think about that segue, but yeah, that's that's a fair point. Yeah, so this, uh, this, this will definitely to, to Manfred's point. Yeah, it will it'll definitely be something that you won't be able to just you know hop in and start writing Trino code using this until we've gotten to those those other checkpoints essentially where uh, where we where we've. Uh, enforce the java java 17 uh for people running it and for people who don't want to contribute at all that you know you you don't have to even pay attention to this part you could skip over this and just you know just know that if you upgrade to java 17 things get faster right so um but for those that you do want to contribute and are writing java code and and uh, uh enjoy enjoy jo a little bit of java in your life uh this is this stuff is very relevant for you so um okay so i mean Multi-line text box, I can't underestimate like, or under understate like how huge that is. It's like it feels like, you know, like uh maybe some people don't think about it as like super awesome until you've actually worked in with with uh, a lot of these and made a lot of the simple like uh errors that you can make in goofy looking stuff like this. Okay. Next one, switch expressions. Um, uh, another very like highly high potential for like uh uh doing um, making a lot of mistakes in particular, like these, uh, this break logic. So those that aren't familiar with, uh, how switch cases work is, you know, you essentially have this day and, uh, you, uh, would have like different cases like Monday, Friday, sun Sunday, maybe these are like string literals and you're comparing them to say, does the day match this day? And if it does, then do whatever's underneath this case. Well, this case is next to this case so basically what this is saying is you know print six in the case of uh you know monday friday or sunday and then after that there's this break element here that says okay don't keep going down uh here but there's a lot of times where this this syntax in general is in the same way that it's just like there's a visibility issue of like accidentally maybe you didn't realize friday was sitting here between monday and sunday it's kind of the text starts to blur whenever you're looking at it. Um, and it's just not super, uh, super straight, straightforward and clear, right? Of, of uh, uh, that, that this is what you're actually going for. You have three different case statements yet. All of a sudden you're, you're pushing out into, uh, you know, uh, this, this one bit of functionality. And oh. if this break maybe somehow gets moved by accident, then you're actually moving on into other uh, uh, code segments. What were you going to say, Martin? No, I was going to say, or you forget to introduce the break there and then you, it it's, doesn't work as as you expect. So yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, it's it's so easy to just not have this there. I'm not even going to go into silly things that I've done in the past. So they they've moved this into kind of a, a more functional clause uh, type of uh, uh, method where you can have multiple kind of uh, parameters and uh, and then kind of pushing out to uh, an execution block of code. And so this becomes to me, much more legible, right? You don't have the cases in between. You're not relying on the breaks. Your, your break is essentially the semicolon. And uh, this not only uh, is, is doing this, but there's also, uh, I forgot to add this in here, but this, this is teeing us up for uh, a kind of uh, um, a way in which you can um, do the, the uh, what's it called? The pattern matching. So we're doing, pat yeah. we're going to talk about pattern matching here, but you'll also be able to do pattern matching uh, if you're doing this by type. So switches can also have types in here uh, where you would say, hey, if it's the type of, if, if day is a type of something, then um, you would have to ultimately do a similar thing like this where you have to uh, cast uh, this generic day object into the specific type. Whereas now, uh, you know, you you would, uh, you, you uh, like essentially uh, with, the, with the updated switch, you would no longer, you can actually do this uh, uh, similar method that, we're able to do with this instance of piece down here. Why don't I just show you the instance of one first, and then I'll tell you how that applies to switch. So ma matching pattern matching for instance of allows us to take something like this, where you have to like do this silly like cast object. Okay, this this generic object is, is an instance of string. Okay, so in this one thing, I've already validated that it's an instance of a string, but then in a whole separate line, I actually have to cast it to a string. So why not make that all one operation? And so that's effectively what pattern matching is, is doing. It's giving us the ability to 
um, to immediately cast uh, a, a local variable within that code block uh, to to uh, to uh, cast it to this particular type. Um, you could do the same thing with switches, right? And that, this is what I was talk, trying to mention before. You have a particular type that you're trying to see if it's the case of, and you essentially are able to do uh, pattern matching. I don't know if that's, that applies to like if there's multiple cases. I feel like you'd have to have like only one type per case <laughs> in order to make that work. But but that's another kind of cool thing that's that's coming up that I just didn't put put out here. So, so Martin, um, Martin with uh, with those case statements, correct me if I'm wrong, but from glancing at the code now and then, um, we have a whole bunch of those case statements when it comes to the connectors where the type mapping has to go, right? Like we have to map whatever the hell those underlying types are in the system. And then we map them to the Trino types. Those are all driven off case statements, right? Uh, many of those yeah. are. Some of those are more more programmatic, and then might like you may have a list of or a map of mappings or something like that. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, no, but it, this is this is really important for uh, anything that has to do with the dealing with the AST, with the planner, the optimizer. We we use switches and and, and cases lot, all yeah. over the place. So. Yeah. yeah, so, so it's going to so clean it, a lot. It will allow us to clean up things quite a bit then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have we ha, ha, anything on top of your head that like any issues that we that have been or bugs that were introduced due to a, a bad switch statement or something like that? Oh, there's uh, all over the place. Like uh, we <laughs> fix them, but uh, yeah, it's very easy to miss a, um, a break or or sometimes you don't consider the default case or yeah. uh, you know, yeah. Very cool. Okay, so those are exciting. And then one that I'm super pumped about is actual helpful null pointer exceptions. Uh, so it seems like there's this effort to basically give more meaningful messages, more meaningful stack traces and kind of context around what 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 led up to a particular null pointer exception. And I one thing, one interesting thing for me, and I, again, maybe I've just been lucky, but I haven't noticed there's a lot of null pointer exceptions in Trino in general. Like I feel like we do a, a fair job at, at, at avoiding them. Uh, I'm not saying it never happens and I'm sure it does, but it, it's like, I, I've noticed that comparing to other systems, like obviously Hive, it, Hive is <laughs> like every, every two, like two operations you do, you I feel like I'm getting a no no pointer exception. <laughs> I'm I'm googling why that happened in the particular context that I was running it in, and then I find out that oh, it's actually this like weird hack you have to do with Hive. So it's like it's Trino's nothing like that, but but still like you know when you do get a no pointer exception, having that context, especially for systems that do have these more frequently, it, it's so much nicer to have so, anything that the the system can just provide to you to kind of give you some hints. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely an R2 error message yeah. generation, and um, I'm, I'm sure they were having a lot of discussions when they got to what they have now. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm excited. I mean, it's, it's clearly it wasn't easy. If it, otherwise, it would have been done a long time ago. But it's like, yeah, it's, it's exciting that these, these are finally coming in. So uh, the final segment, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm wanting to talk about, you know, what does this mean? What does this all mean for Trino? So we've kind of talked about Java 17, uh, which has been the meat, meat and potatoes of the show. Um, but uh, I want to, you know, do a quick thing. And Manfred, I think this could be kind of like your part of the show. Uh, you know, I, I've outlined a couple of the reasons why people uh, typically don't want to, uh, you know, are, are hesitant to, to do an upgrade. And I personally feel like there's going to be less hesitation because, again, it, it was more recently that we've done this than, you know, as the, the the gap that was between like Java, for instance, you know, Java seven or sorry, Java eight to um, Java eleven, and so um, so the things that people typically come up with is like I don't want to update all the clients in the code that calls Trino. That's so tedious. So what would you really say to that? <laughs> well, it doesn't really like so that like. That doesn't affect you because, in fact, the Trino CLI and the JDBC driver, that stuff, as far as I know, still even supports Java 8. Yep. Um, and what we're talking about here is the deployment on the servers, right? So it really only deploy depends on the server. The interface is like the REST API that the clients interact with is still completely compatible. There's nothing changing there. So um, it really is only about what you run on the server and on the server, there's kind of like the major that there's two two major ways of doing it. Kubernetes, well, who cares what's in your container as long as it works, yeah. right? So yeah. you don't really have to worry about what Java version is in there. Um, and then on the like more manual deployment with the touch Z or the RPM ball, well, obviously you you need to 
uh, update the Java version. But again, that should be pretty transparent and, and easy to do, right? Like there's lots of different binaries for Java 17 around for all sorts of like support and license versions that, that you want. And um, typically you only run Trino on that server anyway. Like you shouldn't run like other software. If you really think you have to, you can still run multiple Java versions at the same time. Like every developer probably has like at least Java 11 and 17 installed at this stage anyway. So, and they can switch and you can do the same on, on the server. So there's no, no problem there as well. And that, that addresses the second one, right? I have conflicting Java versions. Now, uh, maybe I, I, I always kind of give the people the benefit of the doubt because maybe they're just running like a sidecar app or something to analyze Trino or something, right? But, you know, so that, and who knows, maybe that requires Java 8 still for whatever reason. Um, and so that 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 kind of stuff maybe is is a, a decent uh, reason for, for, you know, they're trying to pick up JVM stats or something like that. But, but even that would all be still compatible, right? I, like, yeah. yeah. I, I can't really think of the reason why, but I'm assuming like maybe there's a there's a legit they're not necessarily running a very heavy process with Trino, but it's just something that requires a different version. So like you said, like you can have multiple you can have multiple Java versions on the same node and 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 just set up the Java home for each each session, right? Um, and then the final th thing is like, well, my company is pushed off like running these specific JDKs and to be installed on, on, on any of these servers. So I'm just, my hands are tied. I can't do anything about that. So what do you usually tell folks in that situation? Yeah. The other aspect, if, if that's really a company policy, you might want to talk to those people because the currently supported long-term support version of Java is Java 17. Java 11 is on the way out. Like, yes, it's still going to be supported for, I, I, I don't know, at least a year or something like that, or a bit longer maybe. But ultimately, the currently maintained and best looked after and most widely tested LTS version of Java is Java 17, which yeah. is why you want to like migrate to that, right? Yeah, one one option there is uh, to consider running the Docker image, which comes with a bundled Java, uh, so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Now, uh, Martin, I mean, you I, said at one point maybe we would actually <laughs> have bundled like a bundled version of the JDK included in Trino. Is that possible? It's something, it's something we talked about, like creating fully self-contained uh, releases of Trino. We do that with the Docker image, like in a sense, like you just download the Docker image and it has everything you need. Hmm. Uh, but we, we have talked about uh, producing a, like a tar file that contains everything that Trino needs to run. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's an idea still. We like, uh, if people, if it's something that people, um, I think it's important. Lots, lots of software does questions. that actually. Like yeah, there's yeah. just various like the yeah. the most popular software that does that, Minecraft. <laughs> yeah, I, I, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, IntelliJ does it too. You don't have to install yeah, Java, even though it's yeah. Well, that's probably less IntelliJ used than Minecraft. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, cool. So now, I mean, so hopefully that kind of gives everybody like a the excitement and motivation around like wanting to to move to, to JDK seventeen with all the stuff coming up with that and understanding kind of the the features that are that are coming our way. Um, hopefully this addresses any of your concerns about the the upgrade itself. But uh, now let's kind of run into uh, Martine. Could you tell us kind of some of the plans that we have or like once job you know. Java 17, whenever it lands or doesn't land, we have a lot of plans kind of around just general core optimizations around the the uh, the system that kind of some go in hand in hand with Java 17, but others are are just things that we're working on already, right? Yeah. So so the, I mean, what you're talking about, it, it, it's optimizations that play together with Java 17, especially as we start considering uh, using the vector uh, vectorization APIs. But they are not. They don't need Java 17 for that. I mean, we can still benefit uh, even before that. Uh, and part of the idea is to change um, the way some of the core operators in the system work and and the relationship between the operators uh, uh, work. And the operators being the scan, the filter, projections, aggregations, and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea is to change the model to um, right right now, even though. Trino uh, process data or shuffles data throughout the system in a columnar manner. So every every uh, let's say a thousand rows are organized as, as a set of columns. All the values for each of the columns are packed together, 
and, and that allows us to do certain kinds of, uh, of operations in, in a more efficient way, but we don't take advantage of it every, every single time. Mm -hmm. In particular, there are operators like the, the filtering and projection that evaluate the whole expression over the underlying, over the columns of the, of the, of the row in sequence. And that means that, well, it's, it's, um, it's harder to do these tighter loops in some cases because you have more complex expressions going on. It's um, it's harder to apply some vectorization operations because you may have operations in the middle that are not vectorizable, so you need to kind of split the operations in pieces. And and then it, it, it makes it harder to do certain kinds of optimizations, like if you know an, an operation is more expensive than another one, but it's more, uh, maybe one operation is more selective than another one, it may be worth evaluating, evaluating them in a different order. And if you're doing that row by row, you cannot do the timings of each operation individually because the cost of the timing is too high. Mm -hmm. uh, once you start considering batches of rows where you're applying, say, uh, I know you're you're applying one expression across a mul multiple rows across multiple rows, and then and then measuring end to end how long it took, and then you apply you apply another expression and measure how long that takes. The boundaries of timings are course enough that you can afford to do that. And then you can start making decisions of, oh, this is more expensive than this, so I can swap them and, mm. and do one first, the other the other later. So we're starting to look into uh, some of these techniques and they are not new. And these are, these are techniques that have, have been around for a while. And, and some of the projects you, you mentioned earlier are starting to adopt some of these techniques. Um, but the idea is to revamp the, the way the operators and the core evaluation engine works to be able to, to, uh, to do these, these kinds of things. Um, and the nice thing is that those, once we have that structure, it very, very naturally fits into being able to uh, implement things on top of the vector APIs in terms of GPU APIs if, you, if we ever want to get there. Uh, or potentially even generating much tighter uh, Java code for specific um, uh, loops so that, so that the, the VM has an easier time uh, doing auto vectorization. Yeah, and all that will be kind of, yeah, based on just trying 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 things out see what works and see what doesn't right. work and then yeah yeah cool yeah no, and i know and i did some experiments end of last year where i i, I took some of the uh, for for some of the queries that we have in our benchmarks i took the core uh where clause and mm -hmm. and compare with the current engine versus a prototype of what it would look like if we did something like that mm -hmm. and and I was able to see like a 4x improvement in that evaluation loop. So that's pretty significant. Wow. And oh, the other thing that it al allows us to do is if you consider how data gets encoded in, in files, you can have, you can have uh, for different types, different encodings, uh, different compression mechanisms. Like for example, there's a run length encoding uh, type, which is if you have a sequence of, row of, of values that are the same, you just say, I have 10 values with these specific uh, values or 10, 10 elements with a specific value. Uh, and if, if you have a, um, a data set or a column that repeats values a lot, you may have a dictionary. This is a, you say, um, you have like a mapping, mapping table that says uh, the value for this cell is the first value in this map. The, the value for the second cell is the fifth value and so on. Mm -hmm. And then if, you, if they repeat, you can save space and, and, and you can potentially save time. So. There are, uh, there are certain class of, of operations that you can perform directly on the underlying encoded data. Mm. For example, if you, if you want to filter a column that is wrong length encoded, you don't need to apply the expression a thousand times because you know all the values are the same one. So you apply it once and then you, you multiply the result a thousand times. Yeah. So this architecture allows us to take advantage of those encodings and potentially improve performance dramatically yeah. for certain kinds of encoding code. Because essentially that's connecting back, you know, those run length encodings where you're you're essentially running the same operation over and over again. That gets right. back to like the vectorization elements and it all type kind of all kind of ties together, it seems. Well it, 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 this it actually ties ties closer to the uh your your analogy of uh you could do something uh smarter or you could I I mean put hard work and do it faster uh, in, in brute force. In this case, it's about something, doing something smarter. Yeah. You, can, yeah. Uh, uh, you, you can process a thousand values in a vector 
very fast using vectorization APIs. But if you can process one value instead of a thousand, then you're going to save a lot of time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, it's like it's like those. Uh, uh, you, you see some of the certain movies or something like that where they just say like, "All right, go go take care of this," and or "Go go get me this thing over there," and they like they go run like as, as quick as they can that direction without even thinking. And then there's like the person that like takes the moment to think, and there's like this really easy way to, to solve the task or something like that. So right. Uh, right. I had a particularly movie in mind and I was hoping it was going to come to me while I was saying that, but I can't remember what movie I was thinking of. <laughs> um, anyways, let's so make that movie. Yeah. Well, let's make it now. We're, we're, we're making it with Trino. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so basically uh, um, I wanted to kind of take a moment to, to talk about, you know, we, we've, we've, uh, worked on like kind of making these uh, uh, kind of huddled together projects that, that like, you know, particularly with Tardigrade we did before centralizing the efforts for, you know, how do we uh, have fault tolerance and, and failure recovery uh, and, and pull all these together. So we, we pulled it, you know, a couple of people together that roughly fell under this, this uh, project, right? We're wanting to do basically the same thing with project, uh, this new project we're going to announce called like Project Hummingbird. Um, and so uh, we, we uh, basically, this is going to encompass all of the things that Martine was just explaining about, you know, how we're revamping Trino. Uh, it's uh, essentially, we, we call it uh, Hummingbird because uh, they're basically these light, fast, uh, only birds that are uh, um, with the uh, ability to fly in any direction. Uh, so kind of thinking about that adaptive query evaluation part, uh, you know, that the Hummingbird can basically just like, there's a predator, if there's food that it's needed to go after, you know, anything that as it's running or doing its day-to-day -day things, it's able to adapt and kind of move in any direction and, and be super uh, fast about uh, how it changes, right? So Project Hummingbird is going to be taking Trino into that that next level of, uh, of, of performance and uh, and smart performance, I, I would say, you know, kind of smart adaptive performance. So um, so we're super excited to kind of announce this and uh, um, we'll be telling you more about it as these things come down. Um, there's still, you know, I think, I don't know, we're, we're, we're still kind of in the process of pulling together all of the exact, uh, you know, tickets or kind of like issues that people have, uh, that, that kind of go around this. But uh, I don't know, is it, are we kind of planning on this pretty much the second half of the year, starting to see more from pro this project coming up, Martin? Yeah, I mean, we started already some of the, the ideas, the prototyping, exploration, and, and we're going to start getting more serious uh, I guess in the next few months and toward the second half, yeah. Cool. And then the final notes uh, with all this is, you know, we, we covered this very well, but vectorization, as we've kind of learned through all this, is it's not a silver bullet, right? It definitely helps. It's definitely something that we on the Trino, uh, you know, in the Trino project are going to be really like looking into, but it is not like the only, uh, the, the only, uh, um, kind of uh vector that we're holding oh, I, I i don't know why vector just came to mind it's not the only <laughs> dimension that we're uh, that we're looking into uh there's a lot of these kind of you know uh things outside of just brute force and brute speed uh that that uh we're, we're trying to optimize there so uh so with that uh anything else you'd want to cover uh manfred or martin before we hop on to the pull request oh good okay. good all right to the pull request of the episode <laughs> All right. So this episode's pull request is actually, uh, since we're talking about uh, JIT and uh, all the fun stuff about Java, uh, this is one that came in a, a while back and um, uh, it really wasn't really heavy, heavy into code. It's actually just changing, uh, you know, kind of these default settings um, to our, uh, to the recommended JVM configs. Um, but it's funny how impactful this, this one was. So um so this was uh, pulled in by Shubham uh, Tagra, which uh, at the time was working at Kubel. Uh, and um, he uh, basically, they they were getting into these things called uh, uh, DOPS storms. Uh, so from my understanding, I, I'm not a, a super expert in terms of understanding uh, how, how you run into these things, but I read up a little bit on, on what was causing this. And so um, the JIT compiler uh, basically is trying to in during runtime, deoptimize this code, and uh, essentially it gets into a loop. Once it gets it, is that roughly or it, you may go it, ahead and explain it. <laughs> yeah, it's something like that. So, so what the the JIT compiler does is it based on 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 what what it sees during invocations during uh, the initial interpreted mode. So, 
the VM runs in interpreter mode, interpreter mode in the in the beginning. It observes what ha what's happening, like it profiles the invocation of uh, methods, like what are the classes that are being called, what methods, how how often, and all that. And then it says, okay, I'm gonna optimize. It applies all these optimizations and makes a bunch of assumptions about what it's seeing. Mm -hmm. And then it uh, typically inserts a bunch of checks so that if those assumptions are broken, it can go back to running the interpret code, throw away the optimized code, observe some more, and then come back and optimize again. Mm. Um, so there seems to be some, uh, this is something that we haven't been able to fully track down. It seems like a bug in the VM where uh, and you call it uh, the optimization storm because what happens is the optimizer, the JIT compiler says, okay, I'm going to generate optimized code. Then it runs for a little bit. It, it, one of the assumptions is broken. Like, for example, a new type shows up, uh, a new target type. So it needs to uh, generate code for that uh, invocation. So it says, okay, I'm going to go back to the interpreter. Then it runs a bit in, in the interpreter. It, it optimizes again, compiles new native code, runs for a bit. It sees another uh, assumption being broken and, and kind of cycles back and forth. Yeah. So, um, and he, there's a, so first of all, the question is, why is that happening? Why is it not compiling a more general, general form of the code that uh, is, is um, resilient to those assumptions being broken or basically make general, more general assumptions about it? Yeah. So that, that would seem to be the bug. Uh, it has a, the, the VM has a, a, it's like a fail safe where, I mean, th this process of recompiling it's expensive. Like if you have to generate bytecode, optimize, if you are doing that on every single single invocation or every, every few invocations, you're going to waste all the time in the JIT compiler. Yeah. So it has a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a threshold that, uh, that uh, is configurable, a configurable threshold in the VM where it says, if I detect that I'm doing this for this method more than a certain number of times, I'm going to give up and I'm going to disable the JIT compiler. So at mm -hmm. that point, everything else is interpreted, mm -hmm. which is, is terrible because the interpreter is orders of magnitude slower than the JIT, JIT compiled code. Yeah. So uh, what these options do is they bump the thresholds. They say, they say well, only, only disable the JIT compiler if you, if you do this kind of back and forth more than, than whatever, 10,000 times, mm -hmm. which for the patterns that we're seeing in Trino don't happen uh, in, in practice. So mm -hmm. it's not very clear what exactly causes it uh, and we haven't track, tracked it down. I, ideally, we should figure out what code is causing that issue and then yeah. rewrite that code so that it doesn't happen. Um, so anyway, that's yeah. just a bit. So that's not okay. an option and still like those changes, they, they will still apply with Java 17 or will we have to take them off? Or? Uh, we need to evaluate. Uh, the bug may have been fixed in Java 17. We don't know. So, yeah. so, so it sounds like my initial assumption is that the actual DOP storm itself ca was causing the, the loss. You're actually saying that it's when, when we pop out of J JIT compiler and go run in full <laughs> interpreted mode, that yeah. that's when you start to see the... So what, what most people... Uh, claim is that it's this random yeah. slowness all of a sudden just one node or two nodes are just yeah. super slow <laughs> and so yeah uh, yeah yeah we so this is an issue we run into at facebook and and I, actually this is the solution we end up with uh, and the the way i mean what happens is you have a just say you have a cluster of 100 nodes and then suddenly your queries start piling up and then when you go and look all the queries are waiting on one node to complete yeah uh, and then when you go into that node and and run the uh, you can run perf Tyler. on yeah. Linux perf on yep. the Java process to see where it's spending the time. You see, like ninety percent of the time is spent in the Java interpreter, mm. and and that's the, the same time. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, <laughs> well, and luckily these are already like the defaults, right? So if you are on an older a version older than when this was uh, added, uh, which was the case for like Shopify in this in one of their blogs that they they talk about this a little bit, um, they you know they they just realized like they just needed to add this to the JVM and it immediately fixed the issue. Um, so uh, so yeah, so it's no, definitely so so you know one, one comment. Well, not fix the issue, but well, the, these are not the defaults in the JVM. So if you are deploying Trino with your custom configs. You have to add your uh, those values. Yeah. For I the mean, Docker I, for the Docker image, we do add it. But uh, yeah. if you are deploying the tarball, then you have to add those. 
Yeah, I meant to say like, you know, what we have here in terms of like, if you're going following our, our documentation, right. we have that in, in the documentation. But yeah, if you if you don't include uh, these these in your documentation, then uh, uh, then it doesn't. And again, it doesn't I shouldn't say it fixes it, but it, uh, it is a workaround until we eventually find the fix. Cool. All right. So uh, any any last words on that, uh, Martin? Manfred? No, I think we covered it. All right. Yeah. Let's head it up to the demo of the episode. What you got to show? So this one uh, is unfortunately a, a bit of a letdown. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you right now. But I I saw a, I saw this really interesting. I, I like the setup and I like the idea. I just don't know if I'm uh, running it the right way. Uh, it's not very straightforward to get some of the SIMD stuff working, but. It is really fun to play around with with uh, SIMD stuff in general, and I just unfortunately did not have the time to set up set up my own. But I did get to running into um, uh, Gunnar. Uh, Gunnar joined us, I think, on episode twenty five, uh, talking about Debezium. He's a he's a um, engineer over at uh, Red Hat, and uh, um, he basically uh, was was uh, looking into some of these uh, these vector API when it was still very experimental in Java sixteen. And so, um, so I was hoping uh, he he kind of goes through vectorizing fizzbuzz. He talks a little bit about uh, the as the the uh, code that he has set up here, which I know I made a copy of it. Here, let me just go. Uh, oh, hold on, let me just go into SIMD fizzbuzz. There we go. Um, there we go. Uh, I, I'll have to add a link in the show notes to make sure it's easier to find. But um, so basically, he has this little repo where he 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 goes in and creates a, a, a fizzbee, a fizzbuzz, a, you know, a serial fizzbuzz, and then he also creates uh, right here serial fizzbuzz, um, and then he creates uh, simd fizzbuzz, which is essentially uh, running running the uh, the using the vector API code. Uh, if you wanted to essentially jump into that, so. Uh, Going through his results uh, in his blog, he he show he showcases how he set everything up and uh, running each of these. And at the end of the blog, where is the final his final uh, outcome? His final outcome show, showcases uh, um, all of these, and it actually shows a SIMD code uh, running pretty much like way like generally worse. Now, sometimes I think a couple of times it, it did run a little bit better, but overall it was like worse than the, uh, than the scalar scalar, uh, uh, code, uh, was running. And so he followed up with, uh, with somebody in, where is it? Uh, here we go. Update. He followed up with, uh, somebody from the, uh, Panama dev team and, basically said that there was some issue with like the expe expectations on, on the hardware he was running. So I tried to run one with Java 17 and two. So maybe that there were some fixes around there and two, I was trying to run with 128 bits, but uh, ultimately uh, I got roughly the same, same outcomes. And in fact, I actually got worse, worse outcomes running on my local Mac. I think he actually ended up running on a, on a, on an AWS system. So my point is uh, you should definitely like pull this down and start playing around with it. Uh, I, I, uh, it takes a while to run, so I'm not gonna. You know, in the interest of time, we're getting close to the two hour mark here, so I'm not gonna go ahead and run it. But all you have to do is pull down uh, this this uh, uh, fizzbuzz, and he has all of the basically all the code here that you can kind of go check out. Uh, you know what what the vector code looks like. A nice little benchmarking uh, framework that he set up with JMH, uh, just like Martin was talking about before, uh, and. Where is it? And particularly, you can look at the the syntax for for vector. And one thing to be clear, it's not we're not talking about the uh, the vector like class that uh, that is largely like uh, avoided um, by by many Java programmers now. It's like it's the actual uh, um, it's it's a whole separate uh, uh, set of utilities here. These uh, vector masks coming up with the species, things like that. So this is like a really cool, I think, getting started intro to uh, SIMD vector API programming. So definitely check this out. Unfortunately, this isn't much of a, me running the demo versus you know just showing you that I, I was unable or unsuccessful in running it on my local Mac. So hopefully, uh, you know, uh, feel free to like reach out to me if you figure out uh, how to how to essentially make the SIMD ones run faster than the scalar ones. <laughs> uh, what CPU are you running? Company. What's that? 
what CPU are you running? Uh, this Mac, let's see. It's probably not an ARM one. It's, but it's like an it Intel. Depends. It's an Intel, but I uh, can't remember the details. Eight core and in, uh, Intel Core i nine. Mm. So I, I don't know. It feels like it should be able to take advantage. Of eight, eight. And then, and then, yeah. what version of the JDK? Uh, JDK here. Let me uh, version. So JDK seventeen point zero point three in Zulu. Yeah, okay. So I don't know. I don't know why I, I, I had to toy around with it a little bit more. Unfortunately, I, I was hoping that I would just run this and then see, you know, showcase parallelization. Look, it works. But uh, that was not the case. So uh, I, I, I will leave this demo to uh, to be a more community driven demo. <laughs> no, exploration. <laughs> exploration that we could all do together. Uh, so, uh, but uh, but definitely something that's fun to pull down and at least look at the syntax if you're uh, if you're uh, having fun on the Java side of the house. So. Cool. Um, any final words uh, either of you wanted to say in terms of like Java, um, our upcoming plans, Project Hummingbird? I think it's a lot. We covered a lot in this episode. I, I think just a general thing, be ready, like it's coming. And if you can help us testing it already, that would be awesome. Any insight that you gain would be yeah. good. Yeah, especially like we want to... Um avoid surprises like we don't want to like uh, start using java 17 and then realize there's a blind spot that we missed and it's causing problems for people and then we have yeah. to rush to fix things yeah so the more exposure we get the more coverage we get with people actually trying trino 17 the better off the transition will be we did that with java 8 to java 11 and it was pretty successful so yeah. let's try to do the same thing here yeah. And if you're curious about it, you know, reach out to us, uh, reach out to me and I can get you uh, in contact with uh, with the right group of people. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, see you guys in, uh, and gals in four-ish weeks. <laughs> All right. Music for the show is from the Mega Man 6 gameplay album by Shishtaf Swabikowski. Don't forget to give us a star on the Trino repository at github.com forward slash TrinoDB forward slash Trino. And for more information on future shows and to find show notes, check out trino.io forward slash broadcast.